She won Most Talkative in high school, and she has been running her mouth ever since. Welcome to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast with your host, Lisa Fisher. Okay, I love to talk intermittent fasting, but not often do I have a medical expert that can back up the science about what we've been learning. Dr. Fitch, what got you interested in intermittent fasting? So thank you, Lisa, for having me. I'm very uh, honored to be here to speak with you on this topic. Um, you know, I've always been a, a just a lover of wellness and weight management and nutrition in all of my career, which, you know, I was a primary care physician for 10 years. And out of that, I just have always been fascinated by metabolism and how our bodies work. I'm a chemical engineering uh, undergraduate degree, and I worked <laughs> okay. as an engineer. Show off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I worked as an engineer for a while before I went into medicine. So medicine's <laughs> kind of like my second career. So I think that engineering, you know, um, training and undertone in my, you know, my desire of life has, has fostered my love of everything related to metabolism. Yeah. Engineers are known for their curiosity and making sure it all works out. So I, I love that. That's how I got introduced to intermittent fasting was my son's an engineer. He came in and said, have you seen this? You know, he, and when he presented it to me, it wasn't for the diet aspect. It was for kind of the science behind it. So there is a lot of science behind intermittent fasting. And as you know, for many years, we were chasing the wrong and I don't even know if it was science, we were telling people low fat, we were telling people calories in, calories out. And now we understand insulin's effect on the body. When did you start making that connection that it's insulin, though, is important for our survival? It really impedes our ability to lose fat. Yes. And I was always, I don't know why, again, maybe it's my engineering background, but I was always drawn to, even as a resident physician, you know, and medical student, I was drawn to, to PCOS or polycystic yeah. ovarian syndrome. And, and that fascinated me. I did my like third year presentation on it, you know, just randomly. And I always would, you know, just sort of seek out like what's going on with that and the insulin resistance that we've known for quite some time is typically associated with that disorder and, and the driver of that. So that was kind of where I started to you know, learn more about insulin resistance, even sort of before I got integrated into wellness, weight management, you know, the work that I do today, right? So I think it's all, in looking back, I think it all sort of <laughs> helped me understand, you know, some of the issues that we have in our, in our bodies, in our life, in our, in our interaction between our genes and our environment. I, I'm a real believer that there's a lot of interaction that's been going on for the past, you know, um, you know, 50 years, essentially, you know, with the environmental changes that have been happening and, and our genes, you know, being what they are still sort of ancient genes, you know, the genes don't change as fast as the environment does. And, and I think, you know, that's caused a lot of issues for us in our society. Well, Dr. Fung talks about um, how society started changing in the 70s. He said it was 60s and 70s when we started getting TV dinners. And parents were so excited that we could have a TV dinner. Well, I don't want to overstate. I loved what my said. TV dinner. That was right. like my favorite meal. I was and so excited it, when I got the the mashed potatoes were still cold. You and the we, apple cobbler. That apple, was my favorite thing in the totally middle. Totally had totally had the apple cobbler. <laughs> but now that I think about it again, I don't want to overstate it. But it kind of set us up then to rely on that was our first fake processed foods, probably right. Well, I think it, you know, it goes even probably, you know, it it can't be really pinpointed to one thing or another, right? Um, um, in my own journey myself with my own health, you know, I uh, show pictures even of my great, 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 great grandfather who came over from Norway um, wow. and uh, grew up in Iowa and and he had obesity and that was 1850. And, and so we do know that like all of our, you know, our, our, you know, obesity in particular, or an, a desire of the body to store excess energy is not only just um, due to, you know, TV dinners, so to speak, right, right. Or, or fast food or, or any of this, but, but we do know today more than ever that, that the um, processed nature of our food is, is definitely playing a role. So the biggest thing we tell people in general, right, because I mean, nutrition gets so complicated, unfortunately, and, and rightfully so, but you know, for people trying to manage the world around them, you know, the biggest thing they can do is eat planned portions of plants and protein. <laughs> That's what I tell people, right? I mean, to kind of, you know, not just do it willy nilly, but have some sort of structure to it. 
And and when you're eating, you know, you, you say to yourself, am I eating some protein? Am I eating a plant? You know, like meaning a vegetable, a fruit, you know, a, a healthy fruit, right? That's going to be the biggest, um, you know, um, thing you can do for yourself, so to speak. Well, how, when did we make the switch then started realizing that calories in, calories out was a flawed paradigm? Well, the interesting part is I don't think it's a, it's a completely flawed paradigm. So I'll, I'll preface that by saying the, the, the calories still matter, actually, what we're learning. And it's still a work in progress, right? Um, uh, I am not sort of a, a, a member of either camp so to speak, in, in my world, I kind of sit on the fence a little bit because some of the data we have even around intermittent fasting has shown in particular, and again, some of the science that we have early on, it's, we'll preface it by saying it's extremely hard to do nutritional studies. So to do long-term randomized controlled trials in which we get, you know, unbiased data, you know, out of things, right, is very challenging to do for long periods of time with nutrition. And because it's hard to feed people, it's hard to stick people in a ward, metabolic ward, and make them live there so you can measure their energy expenditure. But we're learning so much more today about this, that they probably go together. And they probably go together for different people, right? Again, based on your genes. So that's where I think the future is going to go is to more a precision medicine that can predict for you or for me, you know, what's going to be the best um, type of eating, you know, for me. And, and again, some, some basic um, constructs underneath it, right? Like we talked about, you know, the quality of food, eating more whole foods, you know, unprocessed foods, so to speak. But I'll, I'll preface that too by saying, you know, that doesn't mean you can't have a protein shake, for example, right? Like, you know, people think of that as being processed or, or, um, uh, you know, a frozen meal that might be chicken and broccoli and, and, and something else, right? So it doesn't mean that it has to be completely that you have to cook it yourself. But that's, of course, the sort of panacea is we're all, you know, trying to do it the best we can today's Do world. Dr. <laughs> Benjamin Bickman wrote Why We Get Sick, and he's a metabolic researcher from um, Brigham Young University. And I love what he says. He says, if you get your food from bags and boxes that have barcodes, he yes. said, then you know it's been processed. And so it, it's right. going to, and I, I know as a health coach myself and I, a fasting coach to people, I say, you know, it's the thing of walking the perimeter of the grocery store, right. the, the steak you pick up or the the fruits and the sweet potatoes you pick up won't have, I don't know the calories, you know, and that's where I go to is I don't know the calories of what I eat because I try to eat whole foods as much as I can. But like you, I mean, there, obviously there are times that have I had a protein shake in the last month? Well, of course, you know, or have I had, you know, whatever yeah. it is. You just don't want to necessarily sort of, you know, demonize it where people feel sort of bad if they do have to turn to something like that when they are, um, you know, when they are trying to to do better than the world around them. Right. So it's sort of much better to sort of have, you know, a, a frozen meal from from, you know, the for lunch versus going and grabbing a um you know, something from down on the street, you know, yeah. in the hot dog stand or, yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. something like that. So, so I think, you know, we can, we just have to make the best choices we can. And as you mentioned, the key thing, if you look at even just um, our issues with our, um, our weight management in our country and the, you know, if we use the rate of obesity, just as an example, obesity rates were fairly stable, you know, meaning like, you know, 10% of the population, like my great, 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 great grandfather, right? He was like, you know, one of the people with some sort of genetics that was driving some of his excess adiposity, or, you know, that's the term we use for, for fat storage is adiposity, right? And so, but in that, you know, like you were saying with Dr. Fung, in the, in the eighties, there is where, um, the, the rates of obesity start really taking off. I mean, like in a, in a linear ex, you know, fashion, like straight up, you know, and so there was sort of this critical time, you know, in that that era where a lot of things intersected with our lives, you know, with not sleeping as much, having more TV, having more. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, the TV went off at 11 o'clock or something like that. You couldn't watch anything. Right. You know, after Nothing was on. Time. Right. They, they played the, the <laughs> national anthem and everyone went night night. That was it. Right, right, right. So nowadays you have, you know. 
TikTok and That's right. <laughs> YouTube and and all sorts of things you can you can turn to and 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 hopefully you're not listening to this podcast at <laughs> at twelve o'clock at night because we hope right. that you're sleeping. <laughs> we hope you're sleeping. Yeah, that's that's kind of the beef that a lot of people in the health space have had in the last two years if we battled this pandemic. Is yes, you told people to to do this to take this, and I'm not saying what the word is because I don't want to be banned. But we <laughs> forgot to tell people also: could you get eight hours of sleep? Could you get sunlight in the morning? Could you actually walk the block, your city block a few times and maybe put down the remote, the TV remote? And so that that's just kind of I feel like my voice sometimes is a minority because the rest of the media said, no, go and take that, go and do this. When I'm saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, start working on your body. How have you approached the whole health concerns of the last two years with the with being healthy as opposed to? other options people have. Yeah. So it's been very challenging, especially during the pandemic, as you probably are aware, right? And and that's, uh, you know, made things even harder for us on various levels. And so the things we mentioned, right, sleep, stress, physical activity, those are key factors in 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 improving all your health and wellness. And so, you know, as, as we may talk about a little bit later, you know, um, the benefits of sleep and exercise are very similar to intermittent fasting. So the, the, the biological changes that occur with fasting, for example, um, are this are similar to what occurs with exercise. And so when you, when you get, you know, meaning the, the release of these um, biological neurotransmitters that, that therefore, you know, have a positive effect on, on, on energy levels, on mental clarity, on, um, on metabolic health, right? Like having healthy cells in our body and having, um, you know, decreased risk of cancer, right? Because of the, the, uh, these uh, biological neurotransmitters that can therefore, you know, clean up the cancer cells, right? Get rid of the, the cells that are going bad. So all these beneficial effects are also seen with exercise and, and with sleep. So it's very fascinating how they all sort of interact, but we it's very hard to, you know, we can't work on them all. It's hard to work on them all at the same time. We can, we can try, but I mean, we, we sometimes just have to focus on one thing we can work on at a time. Well, you kind of even referenced in the eighties when we had this uptick in obesity, that's when the fat feet free craze had been introduced to us. We were told to limit, right. you know, not eat shellfish because it had cholesterol. And we also watched movies um, we watched Wall Street where Michael Douglas, you know, was smoking and drinking, sleeping four hours, running, the, living right. this Manhattan lifestyle. And, right. you know, but we don't get to see that character 10 and 20 years later when there may be heart right. disease, cardiovascular risk and some other things. So it is changing the paradigm of what's it's now now we see it used to be cool. Dr. Fitch to say, I only sleep four and six hours. Right. Well, right. now we know it's deadly. Right, it's right, not, right. It's but, not cool. But some people have trouble changing it, right? Especially sleep. I find that to be, I mean, I mean, exercise is hard too. I mean, there's a lot of these things that just aren't natural in our world today. You know, so we're, we're, we're actually asking people to be healthy today. You actually have to live against the grain, so to speak, right? You have to live differently than the world is telling you. And that's really challenging to do. And that's why, like you, like you've mentioned earlier, you need like a coach to help you with that yeah, for most yeah. people, because I mean, it, it's sort of sad. You would think the environment would just support us, right? That's what it's, it, it sort of had done for a long time was our environment was sort of taking care of us, so to speak. But nowadays our environment is, is really the natural environment. If you just live into it, um, like, like everybody else does, you know, like my son, my 14 year old son, he's like, well, mom, everybody's doing it. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't mean you do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so you have to be different, you know, and that's the hard part is being different is not normal. (laughs) Yeah. And you're in the middle of a battle if you have a teenager because a device is in his or her hand at all times. Uh, There is a drive through at accessibility and there's Uber Eats or whoever could bring the food, the packaged foods to your door at all times. So you're in a battle. I'm glad mine are grown and now they're adults and they're saying mom was right. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's good. I hope mine says that too. <laughs> they will. It takes a minute. I'm telling you, sometimes they do the stupidest things, but we were stupid too at once. Well, you kind of, exactly. um, you, you were talking earlier about uh, the eating the six cells and all that. Let's talk about autophagy and yeah. it's what it did for medical science and 
fasting. I mean, it really helped boost fasting when the scientific researcher, Japanese researcher discovered, you know, made the connection and the Nobel prize was awarded to um, the science of autophagy. I guess that word had not even been in our nomenclature before. So t- tell me what you can explain, you know, in layman's terms, what autophagy is. So as I mentioned, autophagy is where your your body, you know, the, the cells in your body that you have on purpose to try to, you know, attack cells that aren't supposed to be there. Because all the time, you know, we're, we're um, constantly producing cells that aren't good for us, sort of, you know, precancerous or other types of cells, cells that we're because we're constantly replicating cells, right? And when we're constantly replicating, there's always going to be something that's sort of, oops, that was a bad one, you know, right? And your body has to destroy that. And our body is has been good at that, you know, for, for some time now. But but these other factors, you know, that are on top of that lack of sleep, as we mentioned, and, and decreased physical activity and, you know, um, this sort of uh, increased caloric consumption or consistent, you know, like eating all the time, you know, not having breaks in our eating, all these things put roadblocks in that process of eating up those, those, those bad cells, so to speak. And so when you have these, these periods of, of fasting in particular, that upregulates the body's ability to sort of attack those things, right. And get rid of those, those proteins and those cells that are bad. Um, and then therefore, um, theoretically, you know, reduce your risk of of having a cancer develop because that's how a cancer develops, right? Is, I mean, we're always making cells that are sort of cancerous, if you so, so to speak, but we're we're destroying them, you know, at the same time. And if you don't destroy them, if they if they then can start replicating and they replicate faster than normal cells, unfortunately, um, and then then you get you know a malignancy. Do we eliminate that through waste? Then what the healthy cell eats the sick cells? Is that just part of our it's just food. part of our okay yeah yeah Good. And, that's amazing you know we just you know process it through our liver and all sorts of other you know and that's the other piece right i mean our liver is like our place that cleans everything up right and and when your liver is dysfunctional because it has excess fat storage you know and and you know if you think about it i i'll tell people um when they're trying to understand fatty liver disease is that you know the way we make so you know there's a a dish in fancy restaurants called pate, right? Yeah. Which is yes. um, liver pate, <laughs> duck pate, right? And so I don't even know if I'm saying it right because I don't it speak is, French, yeah, but you know, yeah. I, and I don't, I don't like it. Like I'm not either. a big fan of it because it's liver. Yeah, I know. Well, but some people, my husband likes it a lot, hmm. but but that's him, you know. But um, the way they make that, right? The way they create the ducks that are that have fatty livers so that they can make better pate is to feed them lots and lots of, of corn you know, to overfeed them carbohydrates. They intentionally overfeed them. I mean, they intentionally put more food in their crates so that they can, you know, get these special livers. And then that's where you get the, the, the prime, you know, liver from in order to make your pate. Um, And so it goes along with us too. I mean, if we do that to ourselves as well, right. The, you know, the sort of overeating of, of processed carbohydrates. And, and what happened in the, um, you know, in the eighties was the development of high fructose corn syrup. And, yes. and so because of that, right, it allowed us to make all of these types of, you know, processed foods and, and, and that, you know, when your liver becomes dysfunctional, then, you know, because it's got excess fat in it, then it can't do the things it needs to do to get rid of all the stuff, right. Get rid of all the inflammation and the, 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 these, these byproducts of breaking down these, these inflammatory cells, right? So then inflammation gets worse. And that's what we've seen with, you know, the interaction of, of, of excess adiposity with COVID-19, because when COVID-19 attacks the body, it also upregulates inflammation. Like it turns on your inflammatory cascade, oh, like I crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it like, you know, your inflammation in your body just goes, whew, you know, like mm-hmm. crazy, you know, like mm-hmm. out of control. And and if you have a baseline level of inflammation to begin with, because of this excess uh, fat storage in your body, then then there's, a, you know, it's like a perfect storm, you know, of the two things coming together, which was why um, there were was a connection between people being sicker who had um, uh, obesity or in right. particular excess right. adiposity sure. know, in their body. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. Um, I want to ask you too, if we talk about the liver, his little neighbor there, the gallbladder, I have so many clients, Dr. Fitch, who are women who are overweight and they're coming to me, you know, for help. And I can't tell you how many have had their gallbladders ripped out 
because some doctor said, this is going to help you. This is going to make your life better. And every time they say, oh, I'm no better, I'm worse. I have dumping syndrome, which is, you know, this extreme urgency to defecate. You know, they said, I'm mm-hmm. in pain. I, I, all these things, the panacea they thought it would be. What is the thinking then? Do And they're often over, I'm thinking of all the ones I have, they're all overweight. Is that just a clutch that some doctors used and maybe they're not anymore? I really don't know. They're by removing yeah. the gallbladders. You know, most of us, I mean, I'm not a surgeon, right? I'm a, I'm a, a internist and a pediatrician and an obesity medicine specialist. Um, so I'm, you know, triple boarded in those specialties. But the surgeons I work with very closely, um, they uh, are very hesitant these days to remove people's gallbladders, sort so of, good. you know, just sort of randomly um, because of that, right? Because they do know that, you know, any type of procedure you do, you want to make sure it's going to, you know, have air on the side of making people better, not worse, right? And so, Really, um, the fascinating part is we really don't understand gallstones. You know, most people have their gallbladder taken out because of gallstone development right. and gallstone accumulation. And then, uh-huh. then that causes inflammation of the uh-huh. gallbladder, the stones in there. If you think of the gallbladder, it's like a bag mm-hmm. that just sits there most of the time until it contracts when you eat something with fat. And when you eat something with fat, your gallbladder contracts. And if it's not contracting a lot, you know, so a lot of the low fat movement made it worse for the gallbladder. So because the gallbladder wouldn't contract because people were just eating, you know, lettuce and And fake foods, a lot of fake foods too. Right. And they were just, you know, you know, not eating anything with fat and it, even good fat, you know, like nuts and avocados and, and other types of, of, of good olive oil, you know, Mediterranean type Mm -hmm. fats. Right. And, and so, um, if it's stagnant, it tends to develop these stones. But the interesting part is, I mean, because gallbladder disease is not sort of deadly for most people, right? Because it's treatable and they take out your gallbladder if it's affecting you bad enough, you know, if these stones are blocking things or causing this inflammation, the only treatment is to take it out, right? I mean, this, but, but we just haven't really ever, it's one of those things kind of like metabolism that for centuries or years, we just don't like, put much like research into, right? There's not like a gallbladder disease building. <laughs> there's like breast cancer <laughs> right. building, right? right. But right. They, you know, cancer center, but there's no like, cause it's not sort of, you know, it's not, not, not trendy <laughs> or people just think, oh, you know, but it's fascinating because the interesting part is bile acids. So the gallbladder makes bile, which dissolves fat. That's its purpose in your, in your digestive system. But the bile acids, which are the acids, the, the actual component of the bile, that make up the bile, um, they're responsible. They're somehow, uh, what we found in, in basic science research today, those bile acids are also pre- the, the way the bile acids move throughout our body. So they go into our intestine and then they get reabsorbed by our intestine at the other side. And then they go back up to our liver to be processed into bile. So that circulation of those bile acids has something to do with obesity. Because when you have bariatric surgery, bariatric surgery actually changes your bile acid binding and it changes how your bile acids move through this whole complex system, so to speak. And that change induces weight loss. And we don't know quite, we know that that happens, but we don't quite know. I mean, I'm sure maybe there's somebody in the research (laughs) Like, that, that understands it better than I'm explaining. They're it. not listening but, to this podcast if they if they're, if they're up there. Well, so. they are, so they can like tell us. <laughs> right. But I mean, I'm sure people are looking at it. Is what I'm saying. If people yeah. are researching this yeah. idea of bile acids. So there is something to do with bile and the connection between body energy storage, and and so that's the I think that's always fascinated me is how you know. And then there's there's sort of the in the med school days. This is very you know discriminatory. We would never say it. Hopefully they don't say it anymore. But one of the, you know, in med school, we use a lot of um, acronyms, right? To remember things, you know, like, like letters, right? Mm -hmm. And for gallbladder disease, the acronym was female, fertile, fat, and 40. So the four Fs, that's how we remembered who gets gallbladder disease. Yeah. Because that was what was happening. It was women in their forties who had had children or, you know, they, Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and they were um, usually heavier, you know? And again, we use the bad we, we use the bad F word back in the day to say right, that, right. but we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't say, you know, again, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that. That's not what it, but that's what, how we used to remember who right. gets gallbladder disease. Right. Yeah. Um, and, 
because, but again, no one's ever, maybe it's because we don't do enough research on women. I mean, that, that's another issue that's come up yeah, recently is there's sure. not as much research in, in, in women. And so, you know, it, it, it's sort of, it's one of these diseases, these orphan diseases we don't really fully understand. Right. <laughs> so if we don't have the gallbladder and women listening, a lot of times women, some men mm-hmm. don't have the gallbladder, then what's producing the bile acids to break down the fat? So the bile acids are made by the liver. The gallbladder is just a storage tank. Oh, okay. So it's okay. always been a storage tank. And that's why it can just be removed because you technically don't need it. I see. I mean, because you still make the bile acids in your liver and they still go down your your um, bile ducts and they go into your intestine. It's just that now that you don't have it anymore, the the, the delivery device, the, the gallbladder was supposed to sort of meter it. Right. So when you, I see. And, and so the issue you're describing with people having um, some chronic diarrhea and other things yeah. is that those bile acids just sort of dump into there, right? Because they're it. not really, that makes sense. They're not as metered now. Yeah. And some people are sensitive to that, you know, again, in their intestine. Yes. And, and then have troubles afterwards. That makes sense. I always, my advice to, because I'm at, up in years myself, to keep your parts, to keep as many parts as you can. Now I know That's appendix ideal, right? appendix has its own public relations team that says yank it out if if it's disease but for the rest of your parts see what you can do see see, but see it's if kind you can of, keep them But the appendix is an interesting organ too right because it's a vestigial organ we used to have a very large appendix it used to have a purpose um you know to break down roughage so rabbits and other oh. animals that eat a lot of roughage they have a okay. very large appendix like oh. their appendix is like huge it's like very large but um our, our appendix has shrunk. In fact, it's almost non-existent. You know, it's like our pinky toe. Oh, <laughs> going. <laughs> but, that is so interesting. Um, That's a great visual. Yeah. And so, so it, 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 you know, it used to be useful, but now it's not. So it, it may, it's fascinating how, you know, I don't know, maybe our, hopefully our gallbladders won't shrink and go away over time yeah, as well. Right. But who knows? That's the other thing. Three clients I have after they had their gallbladders removed, have gastroparesis because three of them said maybe the doctor clipped the vagus nerve, which controls your peristalsis and the way that you right. goes down or, the pike. Or even not clipped it, but even just can you can get some like damage to it, you know, oh, not intentionally, okay. but like just because someone's in there messing around with their yeah. instruments, right? It yeah. can get, you know, bumped and, you know, like, yes. you know, like pressed on and yeah nerves don't like that when they get pressed on. Right. The other thing is, you know, a lot of people have gastroparesis, um, relative to some chronic damage to the vagus nerve. It brings up another, you know, discussion point, um, from, uh, higher levels of blood sugar on a chronic basis. So we're finding that's why type two diabetics get gastroparesis. I got it. Yes, yes, yes. And we like to, we like to try to, for all your listeners out there, we'd like to try to also start using what we call patient first language in our discussions around um, these sorts of issues. So we would say people with type two diabetes, because you notice you said type two diabetics, which is like normal in our nomenclature. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's how we used to talk. I see. But we want to say like, because, we don't want to define people by their disease okay. because again, people would say, oh, this is a, a, a 41 year old obese female. And again, we want to get away from that because we don't, obesity, for example, is, is something we struggle with. It's not defining us. I so see. I am a person with obesity. I'm yes. not a obese patient or I'm a person with diabetes. Yes. Yes, duly noted. So I get, that's that's great for me to know. I'm a journalist. Well, I should know that. So that's good. Well, but it's fine. It's, it's interesting because most journalists do not. I do a lot of discussion with journal mm-hmm. with journalist teams because they don't like people will write stuff. You know, like our media relations will write stuff for me. You know, and say, mm-hmm. you know, can we put this out there, mm-hmm. right? And I'm like, oh, we got to change a bunch of words here because it's all none of it's patient first language, but it's just common. I mean, this is the way we talk, yeah. or you yeah. know. But the interesting part is, you know, we never say this this cancerous person. Right. right. We say right. this person with cancer. Right. right. Um, this sure. person that has cancer or has breast cancer, you know, so we're just sort of trying to change that paradigm. It's a it's a long standing paradigm. that has been around for a long time. Well, but going plus, back to the well, it just points to the fact that these conditions are reversible, too. So you're yes, not always right. a type two diabetic. You, exactly, you have type two right. diabetes now, but you can reverse it. So I like well, that. And it, thinking. And, it, and it feels very. um if you're a type two diabetic, it feels very defeating. Yes. You limiting. Know, like, yes, for sure. Yeah. Like, like it's, like it's controlling you. Right. But you can control it. 
right? You have the power right. to change it. And for so long, I think we felt like, you know, we, we don't have sort of power over disease, right? And that's what we're trying to change with these things we're seeing, right? With, oh, yeah. you know, our physical activity, our sleep, our stress. We haven't mentioned stress very much, but that's the thing yeah. with COVID, right? All the stress that we have mm-hmm. increases those cortisol and other um, biochemicals that also like lead to the other side of things, insulin resistant, you know, the bad side, right? Right. right. Um, and so it's really a, you know, a, a perfect storm of all these things kind of coming together and trying to work on all of them is important. But back to the gastroparesis real quick, because one of the things we've figured out recently um, is that even minor changes in your blood sugar, right? Even people with prediabetes can have this damage to their nerves, which we never really thought. We always used to think of these this nerve damage people get with diabetes, um, neuropathy, right? right? Even in their feet and mm-hmm. their hands usually, but also in their intestines, you know, in their in their stomach and in their general intestines, um, causing, you know, abdominal distension, bloating, you know, IV irritable bowel syndrome, you know, all sorts of things like that. But, you know, it's amazing that we're finding that even smaller dysregulations of your blood sugar can lead to that over chronic time, right? Not like for a week or something, you know, if you are on vacation and you decide to <laughs> sort of have yeah, a whoop, whoop it up, right? Have, yeah, have dessert right. with, mm-hmm. with dinner. But but the thing is, is that, you know, on a chronic basis, if it goes on and on and on every day for 10 years, right, it, it still has some of that same effect, which is why with intermittent fasting, for example, um, and other, you know, chrononutrition, this is the new field of what we call chrononutrition, um, with chrononutrition, what we're trying to do is is understand how to, you know, how to hack that metabolism so we can keep our insulin levels stable, we can keep our blood sugar stable, right, throughout the day, and not have these spikes even on a, a regular basis. Well, have you done? Do you do you prescribe because it's a prescription? I think uh, the CGMs, the uh, continuous glucose monitors. Do you think that's something lay people, even without any type of diagnosis, should employ? So it's coming into practice a lot more, obviously, by some of these companies that are also um, these, you know, apps, uh, these companies right. that mm-hmm. will um, provide that for you. I think that's um, a huge service. I just am saddened by the fact that we can't um, we can't do more of that precision medicine because that's what I would call precision medicine, right, that we need to get to the next level of. We can't do that through most people's insurance today, right. um, that insurance is still not um, like I can't even get people with. I have people with type two diabetes and with, um, you know, who, who are having, you know, issues with blood sugar dysregulation, hypoglycemia, other, you know, real sort of like symptoms and medical problems related to it. Right. And I can't get it. You can't get a CGM covered today, hardly to save your life, (laughs) except for if you have type one diabetes, which of course those people are very much dependent on those. And that's where they started in the, in the type one diabetes. So they could, you know, know their blood sugar and, and the, the insulin pump can give you the the right amount of insulin all the time. So it was kind of like a way to develop an artificial organ, so to speak, an artificial pancreas, you know. If we ever had the committee that decides uh, disease names, I'm going to vote that type 2 diabetes gets a different name so that people aren't confusing it with the more autoimmune type of type 1 where the pancreas does not make insulin. But that's for another time. It's just so, it's confusing for lay people or general public to differentiate and discern. The two. Yes. Yeah. They are both very serious diseases, but as we talked about, one is manageable and can be reversed. As we've seen, Dr. Fung states that in the diabetes code, and I'm sure you've seen people turn their type two diabetes around. What um, yes. eating or feasting and fasting window do you first uh, prescribe to people when you're talking about, okay, let's talk about fasting. I think, you know, it has to be something that people also are, you know, willing to embrace, right? With anything that we do in in life, um, we want to try to learn how to embrace things, right? So we don't always have to, like some people will be really wanting to try something different. Other people are more hesitant, you know, and and more frustrated by or caught up in their, their, the other um, issues going on in their life that it's hard to make time, you know, to make these changes. But when people are ready to make changes, you know, I like to educate people about these, the benefits of things, right? And then when they're ready to make changes, 
I find that myself, for most patients, it's easier or not easier, but they they like to employ time restricted eating a bit better than sort of the idea of fasting for, um, you know, a whole day or twenty four hours okay. or okay. or um, you know three days or five days. You know, and again, it depends on what um, I helped somebody back many years ago. Um, I helped somebody do it who was doing it again for cancer treatment purposes. He was wanting to make sure that, you know, he was undergoing cancer treatment and he wanted somebody to help him, you know, do this. And this was again, sort of the early days, so to speak Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, of the field. And, and, you know, so he, he, we know, for example, with autophagy, it happens if you're fasting longer, you know, so the, the more, the longer you can fast, the more you get some of that autophagy. So if that's your purpose, right, then you might want to do it longer. But I do find that sometimes people find it easier to do things on an everyday basis, right? I mean, versus like trying to decide, you know, am I fasting now? Am I eating? You know, Mm -hmm. having that, um, you know, 16, 8, you know, I I encourage people to start with even just 12 hours. I mean, I think it's good for all of us to fast for 12 hours, which is the way we used to like do it. Like, again, Mm -hmm. when we didn't have a lot of food around, right? We Mm -hmm. would, you know, we didn't have boxes of cereal in the cupboard or Right. Cheez-Its or other types of things sitting around to goldfish, you know, to go grab. Right. right. We um, we 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 just got done with dinner at six o'clock and we, we didn't eat done. dinner at nine o'clock. It, uh, you know, we, we didn't, were done. We ate dinner at five o'clock. I remember, so, you know, that was like normal dinner time. Now it's like nine o'clock because kids aren't getting home from sports until then. I mean, mm-hmm. there's all sorts of really crazy mm-hmm. world type stuff that just amazes me. Right. That you know, even in my own life, I mean, it's sometimes hard, right? I mean, my son has practice from 6.30 to 8. And then, um, uh, you know, I don't get home from work until 6 when I have to take him. I mean, there's no time to eat at 5 o'clock, you know? Right. So, I mean, some of those challenges are real. And so people have to try to just, you know, work with them and go with them. Yeah. Dr. Fung also uses the illustration that in the 50s, um, the, again, there may have been a television set at home, may not have been, but people sat down to dinner. Uh, you know, Don Draper comes in from his uh, upper, you know, his Manhattan um, advertising agency and has a cocktail and they sit down for dinner at five o'clock. Forks were down at 530. And he said right. there was nothing. There were no options to no. nibble and snack and to watch something throughout until you went to bed. And then he said you, they would wake up. And dad was busy. He worked again, either at the factory or um, at the office, wherever he was, he would have a cup of coffee. Now he may have smoked a pack of cigarettes on his way to the office, but he, he didn't eat. But that was the point was he had a cup of black coffee because that was before Cremora, you know, when Cremora came out, that was a big deal in the seventies. So he just talked about the paradigm of what, or what, what we look like and people, you know, that's why people will go and look back and, uh, high school yearbooks and college yearbooks, there were no overweight people, except for the 10% genetic. You know, I, I absolutely yeah. acknowledge that, but it, we have changed and I'm not here to shame anybody. I don't, I, it, it's your choice. What you do with your body is definitely ha- my philosophy. But once people right. start understanding Dr. Fitch, that there's kind of a method to the madness with this, that w- this is what I hate that we've all been told. I'm a thyroid patient. And so when I first was diagnosed 20 years ago and I'd gained 10, 15 pounds probably. And that was, and the fatigue, the numbing fatigue was what had sent me to a doctor. And I remember the dietitian saying, eat five times a day, eat um, 1200 calories a day. And then it, it really didn't make it better for me. It, It almost made it worse. So you know, we've had erroneous information. I, I guess I'm wondering, is it being now part of teaching? Like, are you seeing at Harvard and as a professor, are people saying, you know what, you might want to restrict the amount of hours in the day that you put food on a fork and put it to your mouth? Well, and that's the thing, right? I think um, one of the challenges of um, medical science in particular, probably all science, but especially medical science, and I think it's rightfully so because you know, medical interventions can hurt people, you know, if they're not correct. Right. right. Like, so we're, 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 we're cautious about, you know, um, our medical uh, prescription of things. And I, I, you know, unfortunately I think in this field, it hasn't moved fast, you know, like in other words, because of that, people want all this like 
evidence-based data, right? They want all this data that's like, you know, randomized controlled trial, you know, perfect sort of data. And, and that's, I think, the hard part, right? And that's why we get into these discussions with, or these arguments online or, you know, tweets back and forth with people um, about, about what's right and what's wrong, right? But I think especially for, um, it, it's definitely been increasing, you know, the research in intermittent fasting, um, you know, people, uh, but I have to say when, when I came to the weight center and, and again, I was, I'm very much um, a proponent of trying to figure out what's going to work for each person, because what we do know is it's not a one size fits all either. Right. And so for some people eating those small five meals might be actually okay for them. Again, as long as they do it within a period of time, that's like, you know, not at 12 o'clock at night. Right. <laughs> right. You know, so there has to be some of that there too, but there might be different ways of, of helping different people. But I, so I was, always, I'm always open. I'm one of these people. I'm always open to something new, right? Like, oh, that sounds good. You know, let's, I mean, there's some basis behind it as we've talked about the insulin control, the, the, um, you know, changes in, in these biochemicals like mTOR and AMP kinase and, and the sirtuins, you know, all these things that happen with it, you can't deny that. But because it doesn't have, you know, thousand people randomized controlled trials, it's, right. it's very hard for people to adopt it um, as a as a treatment, and especially in academia. Uh, in academia, we're like kind of the worst, so to speak, unfortunately, oh, <laughs> at innovating are, yeah. on new things. Yeah, because yeah, you're <laughs> hanging on, and I understand that you you hang your hat on that on the science, and so anecdotal stories of well, this worked for me. And uh, our turn, so I received my certification in health coaching in New York from the Institute of Integrative Nutrition. And so our mm-hmm. one term that we walked away with is bioindividuality. Exactly. Right. We're all different. And so that right. even my own family, I have some who fast, right. some who don't. We're all slim right. and it's just right. what works for us. So I absolutely right. have respect for that. Um, so explain to me then... Um, but we are teaching it more. I mean, we are, That's it's good. coming around more. I mean, there, we had a whole conference on it here, which was also kind of, again, it's kind of though it was kind of seen as being a little bit, you know, out there. Um, yeah. Well, I'm trying to think of a good Still, word for that. Yeah. Innovative. Yeah. <laughs> um, good. Yeah. Provocative. I am innovative and provocative then. <laughs> I'm always out there. I've always been the one going, I've always questioned things. It's kind of the journalistic right. instinct of right. a journalist is always told to go and find out and, you know, get two sources and make sure you cover everything. So it's just the way my brain works. And, and anything you're doing, if you're doing it in a positive mentality, right, I think is a, is a good thing, right? I mean, like, in other words, if you, I mean, intermittent fasting is something where it's not going to, you know, it's not something that necessarily is going to hurt you for some reason, right? right. And so, so um, I figure why not try it and see if it works for you, you know, I mean, but then yes, how do some- you, but how do you push back from the dietitians who are telling, because I have one client who said, well, I, he wants to sign up for my course, but he said, um, I was told to eat five times a day and I get hungry. I get lightheaded and hypoglycemic, you know, during well, certain and some parts people- of the day. Do right, and if you're on certain medications, or if you have type one diabetes, you know there's there's some certain people that are going to sure. need a little more medical monitoring. You know, if you're if you're on a lot of um, diuretics or other types of medicines oh, for sure. heart failure, you know, there's a lot of people that you know I obviously shouldn't fast for really long periods of time. You know, because of some of their medications they take and other things. So it has to be, unfortunately, it has to be, like you mentioned, um, very you know, coordinated, right. For a lot of people because of some of these other diseases or these other disorders that are affecting them or medications they are taking. So it is a challenge, right. And, and, um, and we find it even in our space. I mean, you know, meaning um, it was something that, that, you know, we had to educate the dietitians, you know, too, and then we had to talk together about what the science is and, and, and why it would make sense to, to offer this to somebody, you know, as a treatment, but it, it does require a lot of, um, it's not out yet in sort of, um, mainstream teaching, as you mentioned, you know, like, in, um, I mean, just recently, finally, they put more about carbohydrates in the dietitian, in the, um, the ADA, you know, in the guidelines, right? right. They just finally started talking about the fact that, that, uh, following a lower carbohydrate lifestyle is also, okay. For the longest time, it was, you know, as you mentioned, sort of the low fat, you know, sort of right. point of view. So I do think that, um, uh, that, that it'll, it's coming around and, and it'll continue to come around, you know, 
yeah. over time. Yeah. Yeah. The food period pyramid kind of botched up that whole uh, eight, nine to 11 servings of carbs. And we're all saying, no, maybe not. So exactly. Right. And the thing yeah. is, is that, um, and well, you know, I think, um, the key is to what I tell patients to, it's just to really advocate for themselves. I mean, back to the patient right. you just described, right. To say, right. you know, listen, I've done this reading. I've, I've, I have this literature, mm-hmm. I have this article, this book, you know, um, and, and I'd like to try this. We really help me. Because I think so often people go to the dietitian in particular or, or doctor, whoever, the clinician, the psychologist, right? And they just expect that clinician to sort of tell them what to do. You know, like it's like a one-way right. street almost. You know, I'm, I'm going to you, you tell me. But really it should be a, a, a back and forth. You know, like sometimes because of time, we might not ask that question. What do you want to do, Lisa? You know? Right. Um, and, and, and so... I think, you know, having, I encourage people to interact with all of their healthcare providers and say, you know, I'd really like to try this. Will you help me? You know, will you help me try it and see if I can manage my blood sugar? Why is, why am I getting hypoglycemic, you know, and, yeah. and, yeah. and why can, and can I, maybe they're on some medication that's causing it, or maybe, you know, a lot of times just years of that insulin resistance, right. Makes people feel hypoglycemic. So people feel right. um, hypoglycemic. Mm-hmm even though their blood sugar is fine. Like they'll mm-hmm. call me, they're like, my mm-hmm. blood sugar is 80. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, that's normal. Right. Like, but you're going <laughs> to feel a little different, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but they don't feel good. I yeah. mean, at 80 initially, yeah. it takes some yeah. time and you have to stick with it. So you need that coaching and support as you're talking about, right? You need somebody to help support you. And that's where we don't have as good of access, unfortunately, even in the medical, general medical world to those sorts of things. Please tell me that a chemical engineer who's triple board certified Harvard graduate has written a uh, ten books. I have, have not you, written ten books. How many have sadly. you written? None. You, uh, sadly, you, My, that's your assignment for twenty twenty two. I know. This is what people keep telling me. They're like, "You got to write a book." Okay, I need you, Lisa, because I am the worst writer. Because I am a chemical engineer, I do not write. Like, okay. I do not like to write things. I, I got like to you. Talk. I got you and I'll even help you with the audible when we uh, send it to audible and upload it. I got you on all that. You, I can you, handle the talking. I like talking. I, I like do. teaching yeah. and I like giving lectures. I mean like, you know, interactive, you know, this type of thing. Um, it's really, and, and, you know, I've been a clinician for 20 years. So the majority of my practice is still, I mean, I am seeing patients this afternoon. Good. You know, I mean, Good. I still see patients, um, yeah. you know, the, the a l- large part of my time. Um, so, uh, which is what I enjoy too, you know, um, being able to do that versus I'm not a, not a big researcher. You know, I, I participate in research trials, but I'm not the, the NIH funded $5 million researcher, and, which and we're great. Thrilled. We need those. <laughs> right. We're thrilled. You do that. To we need say, all of us. To say you're smart's an understatement, but you also a great communicator and I can tell you love people and that's, that's why you're I good do. at what you do. I do, I do. But so I do need to write a book. That is my next. I was just thinking that the other day. I'm like, I should write a book. (laughs) Yeah. Great job today. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast. Be sure to hit subscribe and download all the episodes and leave a review, won't you? The Lisa Fisher Said Podcast is produced by ClantonCreative.com.